Right. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction earlier and for the opportunity to speak to you um, this afternoon. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of my team that Rebecca um, introduced earlier, so my colleague Paul Nicholson and also Hilary Rees, and I'd like to talk to you about our project, Views of an Antique Land, Imaging Egypt and Palestine in the First World War. Now, we're based at Cardiff University, but we have uh, very fortunately received heritage lottery funding for our project. So I'd like to tell you about it, some of the things that we're doing to achieve it, but also some of the surprising things that we've encountered along the way that have encouraged us to think a little bit differently about how we might go forward, which I guess, in a sense, is the crowdsourcing aspect of it. It's been, there's been some surprises along the way. So currently, as is well known, um, we are commemorating the First World War in many different ways. Um, but understandably, much of that focus is on the Western Front. And um, in a sense, um, this um, cartoon images helps kind of sense up where we're coming from. Um, at the bottom there, if you can't read it, it says, bit of luck we weren't sent to Egypt. Here it's a rotten place, all dust and heat and snakes and things. So what we were thinking about is that um, um, Paul, particularly, and myself, we've worked out in, in um, Egypt before, but we were very interested in um, developing a project which would help commemorate the Egypt and Palestine campaign. Um, so because it was very much a world war, although um, a lot of focus is on the Western Front, um, other theatres of war should equally be represented where that's possible. And um, we wanted to focus on the Egypt and Palestine campaigns. So what we're doing is we are collecting images, and they are in the form of photographs, they're in the form of postcards, and they're in the form of uh, images converted to postcards. Um, but we're collecting images of archaeological sites, towns and cities, military camps, military actions, hardware, um, various locations that activities took place. Um, and where possible, these should be dated. Now, our focus is in the period of the First World War, so between 1914 and 1918. At the current time, that's what our project is focusing on. But we're very interested in what the perception of the landscape, the archaeology, the towns were to people at that time, and how perhaps those landscapes, those archaeological sites, those places have changed between then and now. Um, one of the things that we've been talking about quite recently is um, when we think about Egypt now, um, for many people, one of the first things they think about is Tutankhamun, um, and Howard Carter, so on and so forth. But at the time of the First World War, of, of course, none of that was in place. So they have a different perception of Egypt and Palestine, the archaeology of that world, than we do in the present day. And also, being archaeologists, we're interested in how the archaeological sites have changed from then till today. So many of them have gone through significant transformations in the last hundred years. And a lot of that is to do with making them more presentable to tourists, as well as their um, ongoing archaeological research. So that's the main thing that we're focusing on, collecting images. And at this stage, I guess we're in the process of going from the physical entities to virtual entities. So we're doing a series of road shows, a number of which we've already had and some which are forthcoming, um, where we're inviting people to come along with any kind of collections of images that they have of the Egypt and Palestine campaigns dating to the First World War. So, um, for example, we've been to Firing Line, the Museum of the Welsh Soldier in Cardiff. Um, we've been to the Petrie Museum. We've been to the Tank Museum. Um, very recently, um, two weeks ago, we were at um, Oxford University for the T.E. Lawrence Society. And we've had a lot of response of people coming in with collections of individual um, images, series of postcards. Many people were buying commercial postcards and then sending them home at the, the time um, to let their loved, no, loved ones know how they're getting on. Uh, but we've also had entire albums of images, which may have 50 or 100 images in, which we weren't expecting at all, that people had kind of photo albums of their tours, their experiences whilst they were out there in Egypt and Palestine. Um, and we've got another series of um, road shows coming up. So we're going to be at Carnarvon Castle um, in the weekend after next and at the National Civil War Center in Newark in November. 
And that is particularly um, to coincide with uh, an exhibition of um, the Great Arab Revolt and um, Lawrence of Arabia. So we're trying to tie those aspects together there. So we're collecting our objects, as you like, our images at road shows, and then during that process, we're simply scanning them or re-photographing them. Um, and during that process, we're also conducting training and workshops. Um, we work with a series of volunteers, <clears throat> and they are volunteers from the various institutions or locations that we work at. Uh, we have our road shows at, so they can be curatorial staff um, and museum volunteers at the various locations, some of whom have military experience, which is something that we don't. <clears throat> and one of the interesting um, points about the previous two talks is about who are the experts um, and reaching out to experts. So one of the parts of the things of physically going out and doing road shows is trying to make connections and who are the people that know about this kind of material more than perhaps we do as archaeologists is reaching out to military historians as well. But we're also conducting workshops in schools, um, drawing upon some of the material that we've collected so far. So um, our School of History, Archaeology and Religion at Cardiff University has a series of workshops in schools in, throughout South Wales. Um, these are to secondary schools, and these are all about in trying to uh, encourage um, school children to think about what universities do at an early stage. So it's about widening access and outreach. But one of the workshops that they've been doing recently has been all about the First World War. <clears throat> And what they do is that they have a series of characters, uh, real characters, who, had, who are based from South Wales, but who had ex different kinds of experiences during the First World War. So one of them is a, an evacuee, uh, one of them is a nurse, and one of them is a private Horace Lewis, um, who we found out about through one of our donors coming to one of our road shows. And for each of those workshops, or each of those characters, have a collection of items that help the school pupils think through who that person might be and what their different experiences during the First World War might well have been. And for our character, Private Lewis, we had a Kodak Vespa camera, we had um, a map of Cairo, we had a little uh, souvenir box from Egypt, but we also had a series of postcards, or copies of postcards, that he'd written home to his sister. And at the end of that workshop, what we asked all the pupils to do was to write postcards themselves as if they'd been out in Egypt and Palestine and what the kind of things, how would they communicate their experiences back to people. And here's some examples of some of the postcards that they've done. What we're very interested in, what we became interested in this, I don't know if you can read any of these, they, they make for some interesting reading if you do get the opportunity. Uh, but what was really interesting was that Many of the school children had never really come across the idea of a postcard before and the fact that you write using postcards and send them home after you'd been somewhere, which was not something that we'd ever thought about, um, um, but it was new to us. But it was obviously a very, very fundamental to what our project is doing. This is the whole idea of communicating by writing by postcards and sending them home. I mean, obviously, different forms of media are used to that effect these days. So. And in a sense, the workshops have become a way of crowdsourcing in different ways of thinking about how people communicate at different times, different periods in the past, but in different, different frameworks. I mean, I don't know how people communicate in more times now, but I'm sure it's not through um, postcards. Um, so that, that encourages us to think in different ways. So in... With our, the items that we're collecting, our main um, output, I guess, is to create a website where those materials will become available, which we're currently in the process of constructing now. Uh, that's um, a holding website address now as we build towards the main interactive website where people will be able to access the images that we've collected through our roadshows, as well as, hopefully, what we're hoping is to add additional information about the images, the postcards, they might have information about regiments, about uniforms, about where military activities, about military hardware, so on and so forth, that perhaps we don't know or our donors don't know about that might help um, um, people find out more and also the ancestors of the people who served there find out more about, um, or sorry, the descendants find out more about their ancestors. So we're working currently with the Center for Digital Archaeology um, who are based in the Bay Area in San Francisco. 
And they have um, developed this company, which is based on expertise in working with images from archaeological projects. Um, so they, they used to work at UC Berkeley, uh, University of California, Berkeley, but then they went off and set up their own projects. So they've got sort of 15 years of experience of working with images for archaeological projects, which is why we were able to form a relationship with them, having worked with them before. And so they are developing um, a database for us, which enables us to put all of our content in. The individual images, and many of the images have content on the back, so they might be in the form of postcards with information about dates, locations, publishers of the postcards, as well as comments that the people writing the postcards were sending home. Uh, here's an example of uh, one of the images from our database, and you can access the image itself, but also we can add metadata about the image front and back. And then from the database, the, the idea is that this will automatically upload into our website, which is currently being um, developed. And we'll then make that content available. So you can see the front and the back of that particular postcard there, which is dated to the 16th of May, 1916. And we have some information about that postcard now. Uh, what we do know is that those were a series of wounded soldiers who were at the Mina House Hotel. I don't know if anybody knows the pyramids, but there's the Mina Hotel there um, near the pyramids uh, today. Uh, but during the First World War, that acted as a hospital. Um, so many of the soldiers were there. But it was a common thing, like it is today, to have your photo taken in front of the Sphinxes and in the pyramids. So you'll see many photos like that. But equally important is the information on the back of the postcard as well. And um, so we're trying to make, uh, transliterate that and make that information available. But hopefully, other people, once the website's fully active, will be able to contribute additional information that we don't know um, about the content of the, the, the images and also about the content about what's written on the back of the images. So just to talk to you a bit more about some of the surprises, some of the interesting things that we've discovered along the way, things that we didn't really anticipate, um, but which are encouraging us to think in new directions. I just mentioned about the Mina House um, Hotel, as it is now, but it was a hospital during the First World War uh, in the front of the pyramids. But during the First World War, there was also the MENA camp, which was behind the pyramids. And that was a lot of the service personnel there were Australian and New Zealand, but also British. And this comes, this is an example from um, a serviceman called Herbert Stanford, um, who served out there. Uh, he was in the Royal Field Artillery. Um, and one of the interesting things about this picture is you probably see next to the Great Pyramid, to the left of it, there is a cross there. And that is where they had a heliograph station located on the pyramid um, during the First World War. And that was to send signals using the sun and mirrors to reflect light um, out to the British residency in Cairo. So that got us thinking about, well, where is the MENA camp? Where was the MENA camp in relation to the pyramids? Well, we think approximately about there, but hopefully we can find more detail about that. But it's getting us to think spatially about the information that we're getting. Um, this is a picture of um, uh, the platoon that Herbert was in, and you can see the heliograph there um, with the arrow underneath it. But this is where we think they were signaling from the pyramids through to Cairo. This is where the British Embassy in Cairo is today. Um, but at the time, they were um, sending signals out to the British residency. And we're trying to work out now if they're in the same place. And we're hoping that people will be able to help us find out that information and where that kind of technology was being used for communications at the time and how very different that is to what we're, we're doing today. <clears throat> so we're using, we're thinking about spatial technology that can use us add additional layers of information which we hadn't previously thought about. Um, we've been getting um, we got, uh, information coming through about hardware through the war, which does not surprise us, but we didn't know how many tanks served out in the desert during the First World War. So here's an example of um, HMLS War Baby that was destroyed in one of the battles of Gaza. Um, but we've now been able to search in various different locations. This is the map of the battlefields around Gaza during the, Second World, uh, the First World War. And uh, we think it was located at Outpost Hill. That uh, tank was destroyed. And then we can compare that with modern mapping to think about how landscapes have changed through time. 
Um, I mentioned um, Private Lewis earlier on. Um, he was in the Welsh Regiment, then the Army Service Corps and the Remount Corps, and he was sending lots of photographs back to his sister who was based in Penarth just outside Cardiff. But the great thing through those postcards is that we can track his movements during his uh, Egypt and Palestine campaign. So he was in, in 1917, he was in Cairo, then he was in Alexandria in July 1917, then he moved back to Cairo in 1918, early 1918. Then he was in Jerusalem for Christmas of 1918. Uh, he stayed in Jerusalem, but on his way to Damascus in February 1919. He was still out in Beirut in April 1919, so beyond the end of the First World War. And then finally made his way home via Marseille um, as long as late as August 1919, after the war uh, had finished elsewhere. So that's able. That's what able to had a narrative around individual personnel, uh, people um, that served out there, which I think adds an interesting thread that people can more easily connect to. Other interesting things which we didn't expect um, from um, George Durston, who served out in Egypt um, uh, during 1916 and over into um, early 1917, but he was making Christmas cards out of part of his khaki shirt and then sending them home. And we, it's something which we never anticipated, but it's an imagery in a way which we never thought about. But that's uh, one of the opportunities, if you go out on these road shows and do these sorts of things, you'll come across extraordinary things which you never thought about. So that's one example there. And another example is a pincushion that Private Evan Jones, who was in the Royal Army Medical Corps and then later the Royal Flying Corps, he had made whilst he was out there with a photograph to show that he was well and then sent back home. Again, another thing we never imagined we'd come across, but that goes to show that some of the surprises that you might come across um, when you're sort of sourcing data in these kind of ways to tell stories in different ways in ways you probably never thought you would be able to do. So, um, as I say, we're still conducting roadshows. Our website, which will contain the data, the images we've collected so far, will be available soon and will be available for comment, additional um, information that we hope people will be able to supply, uh, but also for an opportunity for people who don't come to our, or aren't able to come to our roadshows, um, to donate um, material directly to the website via that. So, um, all gross uh, donations gratefully received. Thank you very much, and just to acknowledge our funders, our project volunteers, our roadshow hosts, and our university as well. Thank you very much for listening.